Welcome to the Homeschool Together podcast. Where one working mom and a stay-at-home dad help you navigate the nuts and bolts of the growing and dynamic world of homeschooling. With a focus on early learners. Like me! All the ins and outs of building and maintaining your homeschool life. Homeschool! Find out tips and tricks to make things like this easier. I'm reading! And ultimately, enjoy educating your kids. And what's that last thing? Have fun together! Did I do good, Daddy? (laughs) Yeah, you did, sweetie. Good job. Hello, you homeschool professionals out there. Welcome to, <laughs> <laughs> welcome to your one-stop shop for homeschool information, uh, secular homeschool information. Uh, if you have a chance, head down in the show notes. We have all the links and things that we'll talk about today. I feel like we need a billboard for that. Yeah, yeah. W- the profe- your one-stop shop. <laughs> the w- your one-stop shop for all professional homeschoolers. <laughs> so today we're talking about character development, being a good person. It's one of the hard things in the world. Well, yeah, I think that what we wanted to talk about was secular character building yeah. because so many resources that are out there for homeschool families are religious based. Yeah. So how do we how do we build good humans? Build, um, yeah, put together a good plan on how to you know address yeah. these various concerns. Yeah, and what kind of resources can we use? So we wanted to talk through that a little bit today um, because it's something that's really important to us all. Even though you know we're not we're not religious homeschoolers, we certainly want to raise kids who are. Uh, empathetic, who are kind, who have solid, strong values, and that that embody the values of our family too. So, like, how do we get the values of our family, you know, into our kids? Yep. Um, so, we wanted to talk through some some different ways. Yeah, we've gone ahead and broken them into kind of various, you know, categories. We always like to break things into categories because yeah, it's easier to. That's group how our, things. our brains work. <laughs> our engineers put it into that category over there, and we'll put those things over yeah. here. So, starting with it, you know. Right off the bat, we're homeschoolers. We do academics. We talk about, you know, various aspects of learning and learning materials. So talking about the academic and intellectual engagement that, you know, can be the cornerstone of this. Right. So just the initial one that's great is to use literature and stories, right? Yeah. If we can if we can integrate reading material that can explore different moral dilemmas and show character growth and empathy, showing characters making mistakes and then mm-hmm. and then, you know, why was that and all those like discussion topics, right? Yeah. That really helps us to understand our world better. So that's one of the things that we love about really great literature literature selections in curriculum, like, you know, Build Your Library is a good example. Mm-hmm. A lot of those selections include great ways to talk about, you know, difficult subjects and help our kids to see things from different perspectives. Well, and that's one of the great things about story in general, or in, you can even take this a little bit beyond because, I mean, it's not just it's not just, you know, the written literature. We'll talk a little bit about media later. You can go the same route there as mm-hmm. well. But, you know, really capturing those problems and actually discussing them without having to live through the turmoil or the chaos of that right. character is one of the great advantages that we have as, you know, human beings being able to communicate and talk and discuss things yeah. is that we can engage in those, you know, kind of thought experiments. Um, and really, I think that's kind of the cornerstone of it is like a lot of thinking around you know, how would you handle these situations? How would you approach this? How would I approach this? What do we as a family believe and in, in how you should do these type of things? Which is exactly the next op- uh, option, which is critical thinking exercises. Whether you get a critical thinking book and you come up with something that's got this, or we just pose questions to our daughter all the time. It's oh, like, yeah. this is a real world scenario and this is some sort of ethical dilemma. And we're trying to encourage her to empathize with the situation to really analyze it Mm -hmm. and think about the different kind of moral aspects. And then we talk through that so often in the world, there's a lot of like morally gray situations and just really complex things. So if we can do some real world scenarios, um, this is a very helpful thing, whether this is on the scale of like global events, or (laughs) this could be just something in your home or in your neighborhood. I mean, we have discussions all the time with our girls about, well, you're mad at her because of this. Like they're fighting, right? And sometimes <gasps> they're fighting. Yeah, they? yeah, they fight a lot. <laughs> and uh, and so you know, we'll say something like, "Well, um, let's imagine 
if you had a new favorite stuffy and then your sister took it, how would you feel? Oh yeah. And right. We're encouraging her to empathize with the fact that she's just stolen her sister's new (laughs) stuffy. Right. And so we got to put her in that situation. How would you feel? How do you think that sister would feel? And then you start fighting and you kind of, you you know, work them through the situation and help them to see it from someone else's perspective. I actually use this in my basketball uh, to my advantage, not not as a good learning thing. I always tell them, hey, when you're playing defense, imagine I'm your brother and I just stole your toy. Are you going to let me get past you? And, <laughs> and you just see the fire in their eyes. No, I'm not going to let you get past I think you. I think you're, we're working across purposes here, <laughs> yeah, Yes, but those are other people's kids, not my kids. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my problem. So, you know, if you can bring in some real world scenarios and not encourage them to chase each other, that would be great. <laughs> um, well, so, you know, the, and we actually do, we do this so much that, you know, our daughter sometimes, our oldest, we'll invent these scenarios and we have the current ongoing scenario of Mm -hmm. she's running this massive thought experiment what if all the parents disappeared to antarctica for 10 days how would her on a vacation which she assures would be fun and not cold and not dangerous i'm calling shenanigans on (laughs) and she's going through this and i go what about the babies and the young kids she and she sopped and thought and she said you know what it's important that they go with the parents they're going to leave the us kids left behind right and then she's she's made this whole hierarchy of which kids will be in charge and which kids (laughs) will help other kids and what they'll do and what do they need to survive for 10 days and yeah and we've been asking her like is it right for this you know so she's <laughs> so she's going through a lot of things and it's really interesting she's yeah. very interested she's been writing some short stories on it yeah. um so yeah if we can give them some critical thinking questions then this can promote their ability to do some moral reasoning and make decisions and really kind of think through and analyze problems which is great but, but going even a little bit further like just the deep philosophy you know how do you approach right. that with children i mean we're not going to be sitting here pulling Plato and Socrates and all this. I mean, we stuff. just got done with ancient Greece and that was part of the discussion that we were having is like, this is right. The start of some democracy. We were talking about democracy. Right, We've been and, talking about a lot of things. Yeah. And so, you know, there are lots of classical philosophy. There's a bunch of philosophy for kids books and you can look and see, but that's a great way to start the discussion mm-hmm. on different subjects. And, you know, another one that's good with this is like doing something like, um, you know, Aesop's fables or uh, classic kind of philosophical conundrums Mm -hmm. for kids to think through. Those are really great. Um, I I think that's why they've stood the test of time. Yeah, I'm a big fan of like working from first principles, trying to build those like, you know, what do you think is most important? Well, I don't think it's good to hit people and hurt people. Okay, that's great. That could be like a core idea. But you know, and then work from there. I used to do that with physics a lot of time in in our in, in our physics physics department. We would rarely memorize the equations. We would always work from first principles. I can derive the equations because Mm -hmm. I understand where I'm coming from. Same thing with like kind of a philosophical approach. If you can build that underground, you know, base layer of the building that you're building with your children as a metaphor, you have a nice foundation and they can always work from those good first principles and getting kind of philosophical books to be able to ground their thinking in something that is, you know, just and you know, uh, good and and whatnot. And they can build from that, I think is a strong thing. But you had done a little bit of looking through books. And so it's kind of a minefield out there, you said. Yeah, well, so I just think it's... Especially in a secular standpoint. That's the problem. Okay, so it's just not a slam dunk situation where you can just find a kid's philosophy book. If you find a great one, it's super secular. I mean, you know, go ahead and hit us with it. We'd love to, we'd love to hear about it. But the looking that I did, some of them are like, there's just some bits of religion that are infused into different places. Mm-hmm. Um, even if, um, even if you're not Christian, that they were still like, you know, God with the, you know, whatever that God is, some higher being did that, you know, so there's a lot of that going on. Um, so I didn't find anything that was just like, yeah, I could just put an easy stamp of approval on this. I think from the little bit of looking that I could do. So I think if you're going to get a book, you want to check some things out from the library, really peruse them carefully. Some books are going to need more explanation or more context, or you know you might want to find different things. I mean, that's the thing. Everyone's family and everyone's family values are all different. And so you're not going to find some book that's just going to be perfect. Yeah. So that's going to be a little bit more tricky. Yeah, yeah. You're going to have to take your time and do some research and really find what works for you. And you're prepared to, you know, discuss and explain. Going beyond kind of this philosophical approach, the thing that we're bathed in every single day is culture and culture a lot of times comes yeah. through media, um, mm-hmm. not just online, but on, you know, the diminishing you know impact of television now yeah. going to screens and computers and tablets and YouTube mm-hmm. and things of that nature, as the influence flows, mm-hmm. 
-hmm. We have less trustworthy sources. We have questionable sources. We have things like that. So cultivating your media literacy going forward, not just in the ubiquitous of the ubiquitous nature of the internet, but also the rise of AI and how AI is going to be kind of like this yeah. new new storm cloud on on the horizon. It could be a good thing, it could be a bad thing. You just got to kind of drive around the the tornadoes and stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, but cultivating media literacy, I think, will be a, another big strong thing. And how does how do you imbibe culture and media, enjoy it without it impacting your core? philosophy or core morals or whatever that might be especially when our kids are so impressionable and they see entertainment and they see some of their favorite characters and those characters may do things i mean i remember when i remember this is a silly example but pinocchio this guy well that was yeah pinocchio is always very (laughs) it's always a strange one these kids are all smoking cigars but we we originally (laughs) our kids liked the fancy nancy show for example where they loved the fancy nancy books i'm sorry and i had no problem with these right it was a little girl who loved to dress up and everything and I, i didn't find anything in there on the, in the few books we read that I really had a problem with no. um, it was okay and then I saw oh there's a show on you know Disney Disney kids or whatever and so my girl started watching it and I realized that like Nancy is not a good child in a lot of these shows right she does things that are you know willfully against her parents she does things when they tell her that there's safety rules and she breaks them and she mm-hmm. has no consequences for them and there's just some different things that I was like Ooh, and my kids are so impressionable. And this was several years ago. I was like, I don't really want them to watch this media because I don't want them to interpret. But oh, the, I love but this the books character. Are really good. The books were okay. The ones we yeah. we read yeah, were yeah, fine. Yeah. Um, but I didn't want them to interpret. Hey, this is my favorite character, and now this character is doing some stuff. I don't want them to think that because it all resolved in the end, even though she did a whole bunch of bad things or said bad things or whatever, took bad actions, it all resolved in the end, so that must be okay. Those must be good actions, right? Yeah, so right. we have to be really careful about what we show. And then if we're going to show it, that we have those conversations, right? There's, it's, it's funny as we're reading through Harry Potter, which you know our family enjoys, and I'm reading the fifth one. There are so many times when Harry lies, oh, yeah. when Harry doesn't tell the adults the truth of what's going on, or he, I mean, there's a lot of he's things tr- in there. He's truly the villain in the story. I, I agree. <laughs> so, but it's, it's a good opportunity, right, for us yeah. to talk about like, Wow, he lied right there. Why do you think that his character felt like he had to lie, right, yeah, in right. this situation? And what would have happened if he maybe would have told the truth? And we've decided that if he would have told the truth at the beginning of every book, that there would be no book. Yep. Because he, it's always about him keeping something to himself, that if he would just have told Dumbledore or somebody in charge, that like it would have been fine. It's, it's the, rom-com, the rom-com issue where it's like, right. just talk, please. If they would have just talked to each other, there'd be no movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so it's kind of like this. So even if you have a character that does you know morally questionable things, it's, it's having that discussion with them. But there's so many advertisements and there's stuff in media and there's news stories. And having us all be able to look at that with a critical eye... And as you say, it's not shaking our foundations, which is really important. And being able to say, gosh, what do I believe? And mm-hmm. does that person have incentive to tell me something that may not be true? Or, you know, there's just, there's a lot of that. And you're right, with AI um, and news stories being generated by AI and stuff, it's going to be... It's going to be very confusing. A brave new world. So the more yeah. we can teach our kids about that and kind of go through, and that takes a lot of, it takes a lot of effort. Like, how do you read something and know, is this a good thing or a bad thing and so trying to teach our kids to to question and you know to read into sources and things like that you know we know they're young right now and one of the things you just mentioned always keys in on me is you know at this young age lying is a big thing like truth and and yeah you know what is your word because and i think it's kind of funny as you go forward when people trust things less and less and less people's word and and their character is going to actually matter more going mm-hmm. forward. We, we kind of talk about this with the AI thing where being able to do homework and writing papers is going to become less of an important thing to grade on. Right. And they may move more towards, say, oral reports or presentations so that right. you can deliver the material. Um, right. and in sh- the moment writing. Or, or- yeah, it, showing mastery in different ways. This may be, you know, a move in a different direction where people's character we may go back to the old days where people's word you know a handshake means everything right that type Mm -hmm. of thing because i just we live in this kind of like crumbling you know low trust society right now and so adding more character into the individual people can trust you is going to become i think an expensive you know commodity 
you know, going forward in the individual right. and teaching our children. And, you know, lying is a big one. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's amazing. How many times have we caught our daughter, you know, hey, we got to get our shoes on. We got to get our socks on. Everybody hit the potty. She walks in, flushes the toilet and walks out. Yeah. Remember how many times we've caught her doing yep. that? We're like, mm-hmm. Why did you? Why didn't you just go to the bathroom? <laughs> right, it, you, it could have taken you two seconds, seconds to just to, actually use it. Yeah. But you went in, you flushed it, made it look like you did it because you came out like you didn't realize that I know walking in that bathroom and turning right back out in one second outed you for lying. Yeah. You thought you were smart and got so yeah. like you know teaching those type of moral moral moments is just. I think really, really important at this age right now. Right. Yeah. Lying is a big one. And we're yeah. really struggling with that one right now with our, with our daughter. So, yeah. so these are just some ideas for ways that you can, in, you know, involve academics yeah. and kind of that in, intellectual learning, but let's talk about things that you can experience because our kids are young. And so experiences really do mean way more than words at this age. Yeah. And um, one, one of the big ones, is, you know, is doing service. And, and yeah, doing volunteering. Commun- volunteering and doing community service, I think, is something that no matter what age you're at, helping other people and seeing that return mm-hmm. back to you, I think is something that it's almost primal in a level of like, it, it's like written deep into our DNA, right? Yeah. Being able to help somebody and getting that mm-hmm. that good feelings and good, and good emotions back, I think is something that people, you know, a lot of times we don't, you know, we're so busy, we're working, we're helping our children, our children don't say thank you. you know? <laughs> um, and I mean, we're making killer dinners like I do every night. Um, and then, you know, when we actually go out to the world and actually do service and give to yeah. other people, um, it's something new and fresh and different. Because a lot yeah. of times we, do, we don't, you know, we don't do volunteer work every single day or even every week or every month. And when we actually go out and do that work, you, you realize, wow, that's it's really rewarding. And it is. And it helps our kids to be empathetic. Yep. It helps them to have compassion for others and to, you know, understand the sense of responsibility of being a human in the world. And yep. like, you know, I'm able to I'm able to give. So I, I have a responsibility to help somebody that's that's not able to, that, yep. you know, that's less fortunate. So it is really tough to find service opportunities for families with young kids. We understand. Oh, yeah. um, there's a lot of places where they're just like they, you know, kids don't qualify for volunteering. Yeah. So you have to especially, look around a little especially bit. really young kids. Right. So you have to find good opportunities where that works. We do some volunteer and service stuff through the Girl Scouts that works out well with us. We've done some things through, we have a local uh, food bank farm and they'll let you come out and help harvest corn or beets or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they don't care what age. We've had babies, uh, babies on backs. We've seen from other volunteers out there who got their baby, baby in the baby carrier and they're out there harvesting corn or whatever. So um, that, that's like one there, there's no age, um, mm-hmm. restriction, which is great. And it, and we got to talk all about helping to feed people and helping to give people nutritious food who couldn't afford nutritious food. And mm-hmm. so that was all really great. So, um, I, th- I think the thing with volunteering for me is I always feel like it's something that I don't have time for and that I have to make some sort of big commitment, mm-hmm. But there are lots of opportunities if we do some looking around to do short term things an afternoon um, and, you know, we can make time and I'm, we always do. We always feel really rewarded when mm-hmm. we've made that time. So Or, or even something as simple as like a group that, you know, in your local area that does trash pickup or, you right. know, whatever it might be. You can obviously do a lot of fun, simple things. Habitat for Humanity is another good example. Obviously, there's, mm-hmm. you know, tools and nails and whatnot. Right. So. There's some issues there, but if you have like an eight or nine or 10 year old, you might be able to get in on that as well. And so there are opportunities out there, volunteer work, um, you know, local farms may right. need some volunteer hands. Maybe it's just volunteering to rake the neighbor's leaves that, that might be an elderly person in your exactly. neighborhood. It could, it doesn't have to be an organized volunteering thing. It could be um, someone, a friend who is who is sick or has Mm -hmm. recently had a baby or who has um, had a surgery and can't cook and your child helps you to create a meal and prep a meal for them and then, and then deliver that. Right. It doesn't have to be grand or Mm -hmm. organized to be valuable. That's a really good point. It doesn't, you don't have to think of the big thing. It can be the small things as well. It can. Um, Something that you're really familiar with uh, drama and role playing with your theater experience. um, That is something that we are eagerly excited to not only yeah. just incorporate in kind of the everyday, you know, playing and, and mm-hmm. imagination and everything like that, but starting to really cultivate role playing and, and like talking through the scenarios, but also doing drama where you are embodying another individual. 
Right. Yeah. If we can, if we can do the, have these experiences for our kids where they have to act out a situation, Mm -hmm. this is helping them to communicate their, their feelings and their thoughts about things through this other character and role-playing sometimes when we talked about those thought experiments, what happens if your sister takes your favorite stuff or whatever, like, (laughs) um, you can also play great defense. (laughs) You can also make these into things that they can experience by making it into something that we act out. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really valuable. We were we were doing a, a, a um, an exercise with the scouts list last week about trust mm-hmm. and about working together. And we had this hula hoop and we had to like transfer it from one body to the next body to the next body. And we were modeling the other leader and I how to work together. And then we grabbed each other's hands and we started like pretending like we actually I grabbed my daughter's hands and we were pretending like we we're fighting mm. like we weren't working together and the hula hoop was stuck we couldn't get it off one person's shoulders because mm. we weren't working together and so i think that was more impactful than us just saying hey girls work together yeah, yeah. right showing what it looks like to work together versus what it looks like to fight um and struggle against each other really made all the difference so if you can make something come alive i think it's going to go a lot further. That's a great, great example. Next one would be kind of a reflection and journaling. We, we, yeah, this is a good one. Yeah. You, I mean, in, in some of your work in the pri- past, you've done a lot of journaling. Um, mm-hmm. you've, you've done a lot of reflection. Um, you know, mm-hmm. how does that impact, you know, being a better person, more calm, more orderly? Yeah. I think it, it helps with self-awareness. Yeah. It helps us to, um, at that time to, to have introspection, you know, you can look at a, look at a situation that happened later. Mm-hmm. And we can encourage our kids to, hey, something tough happened today. Why don't you journal about that, right? And yeah. then they can sit down and they can think about it and write through their thoughts, whether they're writing them or dictating or drawing a picture. Mm-hmm. If you've got a younger kid, hey, you know, so-and-so on the you know playground was treating this other kid poorly today. Mm, maybe we could draw a picture of how that could have gone differently, what the right thing would have been to do. What could you have done in this situation? Could you have gone over and helped? You know, could you have gone over and welcomed that new child to the co-op or whatever? Yeah. So, you know, it doesn't have to be written to, to be, I think, an important journaling exercise. And we, we've talked about processing in the past. Our daughter does a lot of um, lengthy processing before she actually brings forward something that might yeah. bother her. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, all, every kid is different, obviously. But for our daughter, sometimes we won't even know that there's an issue. She'll be processing it internally, mm-hmm. and it may go a day, two days, three days, four days later. Yeah, she'll bring up something that happened a few days ago and say, "Mommy, I didn't, you know, understand why that happened or this yeah. happened." And she's been upset for multiple days and didn't feel ready to talk just, about it. Yet. She's uncertain, and she's been processing, thinking about mm-hmm. it, trying to figure it out, and then she can't, or she needs some help, and then she'll bring it up and and whatnot. So. Doing that type of introspective thinking or journaling may be a way to process certain issues that may have happened or understanding, you know, what are better ways that they can respond. You know, a lot of times we'll, we'll have a kid who has some bad behavior and they'll come down an hour later and they'll they'll just apologize because they realized yeah. after processing and relaxing that, oh, I did have bad behavior and that was not very good. Yeah, that time for self-reflection, however you get that to happen, is a great experience. Another thing that, you know, we, we're doing this with a lot of the, with the scouts now, but this kind of this outdoor education and using the outdoors to help us educate, you know, and right. model good behavior and cooperation. Cooperation, teamwork, persistence, you know, resilience. Doing things that are expected of you when they're expected, right? Yeah. So sometimes like, I think I think a lot of times with kids, they realize, oh, they're free and fancy free and they get to do things. And all of a sudden now they have chores and there's an expectation mm-hmm. because we're starting to cultivate them to be adults where we have a lot of responsibility that we have right. to, you know, keep up and 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 if we if we let it fall down it, it falls down nobody does the dishes if i don't do them you exactly know? <laughs> nobody's going to do it right and so we're, we're trying to teach them you know how to handle responsibility yeah, and we and doing that with outdoor activities like when you guys go camping or you do your outings right everyone has a job has everyone a job. pitches in and you know getting them out of their comfort zone too mm. and putting them in situations where um, they got to kind of think on their feet a little bit more. I mean, in a safe way, of yeah, course, with exactly. us there. But I think that doing things outdoors and having those experiences, whether you're working on gardening and, you know, how well you're how well you're caring for your garden and, you know, what that means later. Are you being a good steward of the environment? So there's there can be a lot of good good values to share by being outside. So yeah. it was one that we didn't really realize. I was doing research for the show and I was like, oh. That is actually a really good idea. Boy, how could we use outdoor opportunities to kind of teach some of the values that we're looking to instill? Exactly. Going beyond 
um, this idea of experiential learning, going more into this more, um, more of this intangible idea of the social and emotional development. You may have heard mm-hmm. terms like the social and emotional development. Um, for me, it was a very foreign concept when we started the, I think the Torchlight pre-K had a lot of this right. in it. And I was wholly unaware of this being a thing because I don't know, I'm maybe I'm just the bruising rock of a man who... They just didn't teach this when we were kids. It just wasn't a thing, right? It was just behave, be nice, whatever. But yeah, being more empathetic, being more internal. So the first thing would be like peer interaction and cooperative learning. I think peer interaction is very easy to explain. Obviously, should just be nice and, and work together. But the co- cooperation is not something that I think was uh, outside of for me for sports being sports i never really did like a lot of like teamwork or right. you know like scouts type of stuff and whatnot i was really just a kind of a lone wolf <laughs> you know i'm um, giving them an opportunity to work together is great because yeah. it, it gives them a chance to kind of collaborate collaborate try to communicate effectively that's the big one right trying to really communicate how they feel and resolve conflicts this is this is a hard one for us because yeah. you know you're seeing we, we see it all the time, even when we go to the park and our, you know how kids make friends like instantly with other kids. It's really pretty cool. Yeah. They, they go to the park. They've never seen these kids before. And all of a sudden they make friends and they're all a gaggle of kids and they're playing different games. They still don't know each other's names. Yeah. They, yeah, they never do. But, um, it's an opportunity for them to try to resolve conflicts Yeah, without us there to tell them like, you know how to do it. And then later, oftentimes we'll talk about it afterwards. Oh, we were playing this game and so-and-so wanted to do this, but we all wanted to do this. Well, okay. How'd you guys resolve it? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, we just shouted at him until he had to do what we wanted. So, okay. Well, was that the, the right way to handle it? Do you think that was, how do you think that might've made him feel? And we, we have those conversations and then hopefully the next time mm-hmm. they'll work together. And, you know, so um, figuring things out in their own setting between themselves is really good. Yeah. It's, it's, it's such a difficult thing. And it's, it's kind of funny when you, when you see a play out really like naturally and you watch yeah. the kids resolve it's and like sometimes they do it well and i'm like yes oh, we gotta try to do this all the time yeah. <laughs> you know it's just how it works mm. next one would be like kind of mindfulness and emotional regulation i think with all of our young kids you know pre-adolescent even into teenage you know years regulating those emotions is really yeah. tough it's, I mean, hard. Heck, it's hard heck, as an adult as an adult to regulate your emotions i know right and but teaching kids how to you know have an emotion and how to express that in a constructive way so that we're not, you know, um, how many years did we say, use your words, use your words, tell me what's happening. What's wrong? What's wrong? Right. Use your words. <laughs> and, how, and how can you experience your emotion without hurting somebody else? Yeah. Right. Just because you're angry or you're upset, you know, how can you do that in a way that's respectful of somebody else and their feelings? So things like, uh, meditation or yoga, we really love cosmic yoga on YouTube. If you haven't yeah. done that, she's yeah. delightful. Um, that's a really great one, but this helps them to develop self-control and, and again, empathy, not just towards others in this case, but towards themselves. Like sometimes we have to be, sometimes we have to be compassionate with ourselves. Sometimes Mm -hmm. I I really struggle with this as an adult. I'm really hard on myself. Mm -hmm. Um, And oftentimes I just have to remember to like, okay, you know, give yourself a pass, right? (laughs) Don't be quite so hard on yourself. So, um, so that's a really good one. So if you haven't checked that out, that's really terrific. Um, And next is modeling and mentorship. I think this is kind of explains itself, but we have to try our best as parents to yeah. model effective, you know, moral behavior for them, right? We got to try to yeah. show our values on our sleeve and so they, they can see that. And it's a, lot, you know. a lot of kids will mimic what they see around them. And, and you, you know, I'm not saying like general thing, but sometimes when you have kids who are, you know, had bad behavior or whatnot, you know, a lot of times they're mimicking what they're seeing elsewhere, right? Mm-hmm. Like, even just seeing our daughter playing with some kids, all of a sudden she'll start saying things in certain ways. And be like, where did you get that? Like, yeah, that we've wasn't seen from that, us. That wasn't from us. That wasn't from in this house. You're talking, you know, very funny. And it's fine. I don't mind it. But like, where did you learn that? Like, oh, you learned it over here, right? So kids mimic what they see. Um, and you are with them most of the time. And you are their mentor. Um, and, and giving them that opportunity to you know, understand what you're saying and what you're doing and, and, and then go ahead and, and model that out into the world. I also like the idea of actually giving younger kids the ability to mentor, you know, like, like an eight or nine year old to mentor a six year old or a seven year old and, and, yeah. and be in charge there so that they can then feel like 
they can have a good perspective, starting to have the parental perspective where they're seeing like, okay, you kids got to behave, you know, stop fighting, mm-hmm. you know, do, don't do that type of thing. It's, it's really funny to see like a 10 year old turn around to a six year old and say, no, we don't act like that. Yeah. Right. Or that, and that's one of the things that's we need great. to be nicer and, and more, more respectful. It's very yeah. funny. You know, for co-ops and things, oh, yeah. you know, those multi-age spaces. And that's what's so wonderful. Even the classes we take the parent partnership, they're on average three grade ranges together so yeah. three grades together um but there are some classes she's got a couple classes actually that are six grades wow. together and you definitely can see that dynamic of older students helping to mentor younger ones. her dance class is a great example of that right she's There's got some... sixth and seventh graders and she's a second grader i mean she looks like one of them but <laughs> yeah she's really tall <laughs> she's really tall uh-huh. but you know it's 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 funny how how she 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 feels a little bit out of her element but she those younger kids, they look up to those older kids in, in a way that you don't see with the parents, right? The parents, they just take those kids, they take us for granted. But sometimes with those older students, that it, they yeah. can really look up to those kids. It makes a big impression, which huge. means that it's really important for us to, to ensure that they have the right kind of mentors. Yeah. I mean, that's right. the thing for us. It's like you know, looking at other kids and saying like, oh, well, that's not the kid I'd like you to copy yet. Yeah. You know, why don't we <laughs> steer towards this other kid? Um, so you have to be a little careful what mentors they have, but mentorship is a really powerful way. Um, moving beyond that, obviously we we dabble in curriculum. We always think of terms of that, and I know you unschoolers are, are, are not in that category. But well, There's got to be a program for this. There's got to be a program for this. There's got to be some structured resource. How, what can I do? I can't just do this on the fly. I'm so busy. I can't keep this in my mind. You know, How can I put something into place. Right. So there's some different secular programs. One of the ones that I found was called Character Counts, and we'll put a a Mm -hmm. link in the show notes, but it's got activities and discussions and resources for teaching different virtues, you know, honesty and respect and responsibility and all those kinds of things. Um, Some of these that you'll find are actually meant for the the public school classroom or private school classroom because they're trying to teach those younger elementary grades some of these good foundational values. So oftentimes some of the ones that I've seen, they're, they're totally secular because because they're meant for, you know, public institutions. So you're going to have to, you know, your mileage may vary. You might have to take pieces and things, but it could give you a good, like I, I was looking on the character accounts, for example, and there was just a whole list of all of the values. I was like, oh, it's kind of nice to have a list here. <laughs> Go like, oh, which ones maybe do we need to, you know, do some work on or yeah. whatever. It was kind of nice to just see it laid out there. So if you're looking for programs, you can check that one out um, or look for other ones about, you know, uh, virtues and character building for schools, you might find some good things. And with some of the early secular curriculum, such as, you know, Torchlight or... or um, Torch, uh, Torchlight's a great example. Torchlight's a great one, So yeah. pre-K has got social emotional intelligence stuff all about, like, do you understand how other people are feeling and trying to really... Molly and Keela was the book. No, and, no, no, that uh, was for Torchlight K. So Torchlight, Torchlight K. pre-K has got um, stuff all about, like, understanding other people's feelings. That's so I heard your feelings, Yes, right? it's yeah. all about empathy, and it's about regulating our own emotions, understanding how I feel and how I can communicate that. So that's great for Torchlight Pre-K. Um, I, I think we're going to be skipping... We're going to be skipping and going right into around the world here with our daughter. I don't know that we're going to get too much of pre-K, but I want to do just that piece yeah, yeah, I because agree. it's so good. So if you haven't, if you don't have Torchlight Pre-K and this is a, a spot for you, you might look at some of the resources. Yeah, I remember those there. little those little bear cards. Yeah, I heard your feelings, the Ebu feelings. cards. Yeah, they're the great cards, yeah. um, to look at these pictures. You look at these pictures of different animals. I and think it was like bears. Or, yeah. yeah, different situations. How does the bear or the pig feel? Yeah. yeah, and they're like, huh, can you interpret this just by looking at this picture, how everybody might be feeling? And it, it's really good training. So yeah. so that one's good, and they have a bunch of different emotion cards. And then for Torchlight K, they have stuff about um, – they have some mindfulness stuff. They have some Zen shorts um, books, um, which we didn't find as good. But then they have Molly and Keela, which is all about these morality stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we personally didn't click with those. Our daughter just saw right through it. She needs her, she needs that kind of lessons through regular literature. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know other people that love Molly and Keela. They think it's terrific. So, yeah. and Molly and Keela also had a lot of um, material at the end of the chapter to help you ask, answer, ask questions of your learner and whatnot. So right. if you're looking for more of a guided book, that was a good one. Yeah, that was a decent one. Yeah. Um, so another option, there's, there's products like, you know, Big Life Journal, things with, if you look up growth mindset stuff for mm-hmm. kids, that's a good one because it often includes some of these great values and that's going to be in, in, often a growth in a secular manner. That's very corporate. Are you trying to 10X your Lego holdings? <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah, I mean, look, we're all on this journey to be better people. Yeah, yeah, and we want our kids to be 
to grow up to be good. But we want them to be good little humans and we want them to grow up to be good adult humans too. So, so these are just some thoughts we have. Um, but just kind of to wrap it up, you know, values and their application are unique to everybody. Yeah. So no resource is going to be perfect. Find what works for you. Find what you want to discuss. And, you know, if if it's not perfect, then what can you adapt or or use it as a good way to discuss how people's values are different? And, you know, so um, there's that. And if you're going to use any books or things, just really thoroughly research that stuff. Um so one of the things for us we were talking about, like, how could we apply this in our homeschool? Because we're, of course, you know, always trying to, I don't know, find new new things. We do these episodes on something that we think is important, and we're like, oh, yeah, are we really doing that? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, all, we always find things that we might be lacking in, right? I exactly. Mean, I do this research for these episodes, and then I go, gosh, these are some good ideas. We should. And one of the things yeah. we're thinking about is, like, could we just take a couple of facets, like maybe a couple of values that are – really important for the moment for whatever we're struggling with, right? So obviously, honesty is probably one that we need to (laughs) highlight. Um, Honesty and and empathy, I think, would be the two that our daughters would benefit the most from right now, because Mm -hmm. they they are starting to realize that like lying is a thing they can do and they can try to get away with. And they also um, are really struggle with, you know, having empathy for the other the other person and most of their fights devolve from you know, not having any care what the other person feels like, not yeah. understanding their perspective. So, you know, maybe just take a couple, you know, focus on a couple of values that you want to really work on um, and then find ways you can incorporate that with literature selections and ask AI or whoever about, you know, great books that have these themes, read those or do exercises or do role playing um, Things like that to try to focus on those couple of values. So I think that's what we're going to. And those to are do. going to evolve over time, and that, and that's really nice. You just roll on new skills that you change. want to learn. Yeah, absolutely. I think this was really helpful. Yeah, I think overall, you know, just like we as homeschoolers say that we learning is happening every day, all the time. There's always an opportunity for learning. I think this is exactly the same thing. Mm-hmm. There's always an opportunity for character building mm-hmm. every day, whether it's something that's going on with us and we take the time to tell our kids why we did or didn't do something so that they understand whether it's you know going to the store observing other people and what they're doing or they go to the co-op and something happens and we use it as an opportunity to discuss Mm -hmm. um i think the challenge is not to be too heavy-handed with it but to just look for little ways to infuse your everyday with some secular character building thanks so much for joining us today and making us a part of your homeschool journey please engage with us on social media join our homeschool together podcast group on facebook and find us at Homeschool Together Podcast on Instagram. We'd love to hear your feedback, questions, and recommendations. Until next time. Happy homeschooling!